I am Dr. Sean McFate, and I am a professor of war. Today, we're going to study the strategy of Sun Tzu and the power of strategic deception. Sun Tzu was facing this problem. How does David beat Goliath? Clausewitz in Germany assume the strong dominate the weak. It's the natural order of things. They don't even consider it. In fact, they build their whole war strategy upon the premise that brute strength matters most. Hence, their focus is on superior military as the main instrument of war, the decider of international politics. But there are strategies for the weak to reliably defeat the strong if, there, if certain preconditions exist, but they must adapt a different kind of warfare and a different type of thinking than Clausewitz in Germany. This is not the Western way of war. Sun Tzu re represents, in some ways, the antithesis of the Clausewitzian, Germanian, Western way of war. And Sun Tzu is perhaps the oldest and most famous strategist to tackle on the David versus Goliath problem. His answer is this, his book, The Art of War. Sun Tzu is actually pronounced Sun Tzu, and it means scholar son uh, in ancient uh, Chinese. But he's more than a scholar. He was a general, a practitioner, as we will get to later. He is often not taught in Western war colleges or security studies programs. And when he is taught, it's often badly. In war colleges, if he's taught at all, it's usually by a Clausewitzian scholar who does not understand Sun Tzu and perhaps even disdains Sun Tzu. They look at Sun Tzu with cognitive dissonance or they belittle him as little more than the fortune cookie of strategy. So no wonder that Western militaries and Western nations keep falling for Sun Tzu's strategic traps decade after decade. When it comes to war, the price of ignorance is blood. Before we delve into Sun Tzu's strategy, we must understand who he was and his times. If we didn't, it would be like trying to understand Clausewitz without any knowledge of European history, the Enlightenment, or Napoleonic warfare. Trying to read a text in a vacuum of historical context is folly. So who was Sun Tzu? Well, given my last statement of historicity, his historicity is uncertain, sort of like Homer. Uh, we believe he exists, but we don't have hard evidence. We believed he lived from about 544 to 496 BCE. BCE is an academic term for BC. Um, we know that he, if he existed, he was a mercenary general, and this was common in the wars of ancient China. Uh, princes and kings and emperors ruled provinces and states or nations as we might think of them today. They didn't really have a standing army. Sometimes they did, but standing armies are very expensive. And when they needed to deploy their army, they would, they would interview what we might consider to be general consultants, like consultants of generalship. Um, today, we would look at these as mercenaries. But then when you hire a specialist to rule your army and run it, that was very, very common when Su in Sun Tzu's day. So he was a, a general for hire, as were many other people. There's a lot of ap apocryphal tales attributed to him, uh, but we don't have any evidence for this. Uh, the three most famous are this. One are these two great lines. Um, Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Now, as wonderful of those, as those lines are, we can't find that in the, in the art of war. We don't know where that comes from. His, also, his job interview is apocryphal. The, um, the job interview goes like this. When he was interviewing for his job as sort of a mercenary general to take over the general of Prince Wu or King Wu's province, the king uh, brought 
master Sun Tzu in and said, okay, you, you think you can run an army? I want you to start by running my harem. At the time uh, in ancient China, having many concubines was normal for a leader in ancient China. So he said, run my harem. Here are my 40 concubines. Brings them out. And, he, and the king tells Sun Tzu, make them march. And so Sun Tzu gets in front of them and goes, fall in, and they all giggle. He says, you know, uh, right face, march, and they all giggle. And then he, he gets angry, and he takes the two lead and the two favorite concubines. And the king looks with apparition upon this and saying, oh, what's he doing? And then he kills them. Sun Tzu slices their heads off, and the heads roll. And the harem is aghast, and the king is aghast, and the king's going to go, is about to launch into Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu holds up his hand and says, stop, wait, you hired me to do a job. The interview's not over. The king sits back down. Sun Tzu gets in front of the harem and says, fall in, and they all fall in. Right face, march. They all right face, and they march. And Sun Tzu gets the job after that. It tells you also a little bit about Sun Tzu's civ mill relationship ideas. Now, as interesting as these stories are, there's, this is not attributed to the text of Sun Tzu's Art of War. This came later on in um, the dialogues and other things that followed, which we're not going to get into, but we can't directly attribute it to Sun Tzu. And lastly, you must understand what Taoism is. Taoism means the way. Uh, you can't understand Sun Tzu without understanding the context of the cosmology of his times. It would be like trying to understand Clausewitz without understanding what the Enlightenment was all about, what the church represented in Europe, and what antiquity represented to the Enlightenment. So what is Taoism? Taoism was sort of it's ancient Chinese cosmology. It's not exactly a religion. It's not exactly a philosophy. It's something in between. Uh, it, it is prehistorical, um, and everybody at that time practiced Taoism. So what is Taoism? Well, maybe the best way to explain it might be something like this.
Sun Tzu was a Taoist. Taoists believe in this force that binds the world together. It's an energy. In ancient China, it's called qi as well, qi energy. Curiously, the history of Star Wars' ideas go back to ancient, well, even before China. China has the, ancient China has this Taoist idea, and when Buddhism came out of northeast India around the 4th century BCE, it sort of blended with Taoism in China, and that created Chan Buddhism, this mystical Buddhism that went into Japan that created Zen Buddhism. And in the 1960s, a Zen monk slash scholar called D.T. Suzuki Goes to, San Fran goes to California, and he sort of starts spreading the ideas of Zen Buddhism in the 50s and 60s. And Alan Watts, another scholar, picks those up. George Lucas picks up that. And it was all over in the 60s, in the 1960s, it was all over California, the sort of Zen idea, Buddhist ideas, and it still lingers there today. This idea comes directly back to Taoism, and that's the story of how Star Wars is really a Taoist tale. Uh, it's science fiction with space sorcerers called Jedi who are Taoist sort of Shaolin knights. Sun Tzu um, probably didn't have telekinesis or powers of the Force, um, but this is the think of the Force as a, a modern analog in a kind of facile way to Taoism. So Taoism is the most ancient of Chinese mysticism. It's not an organized religion. It's more of a cosmology. It existed before Confucianism and before Buddhism. Confucius, Confucius actually commented on Taoist texts like the I Ching, which are prehistorical, and Buddhism blends with Taoism to make Chan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. And it shares similarities, believe it or not, with ancient Stoicism of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, which was the preeminent sort of philosophy of the elite, um, and many Romans uh, and, and many in the ancient world before Christianity took over around 313 AD or uh, CE. So the Tao, again, it means the way, and it's a, again, it's a mystical understanding. It's not rational analysis. It's not organized religion. It's a mystical understanding Somewhat like maybe Judaism in, uh, in ancient uh, Celtic religions or Celtic culture. And your purpose as a Taoist, as a human being, as a Taoist human being, is to seek to follow the way. Seek to follow the force. Um, and if you don't, the force fights back. The way fights back. And it brings, quote, misfortune, unquote. So maybe you've had this experience where you want to be, say, a lawyer. But everything you do to try to become a lawyer or a doctor, it just fails for outrageous and unlucky reasons. Meanwhile, if you decide you want to become a military officer, everything is just smooth. It's easy for you. You don't have to think about it. Others struggle where you succeed. A Taoist would interpret that as saying you are following your wave in the Tao. You are, think of the Tao as a big river, and you are, you've just found your current, and if you go with the current, things will succeed. If you fight the current, it brings misfortune. So again, this is not fatalism. It's a dynamic force governing the universe. So it's not like you have a set trajectory. God has got a plan for you. No, the Tao is a dynamic force that's ever-changing, hence things like the Book of Change, the I Ching. It's ever-changing. Your goal is to get in tune with that, that the Tao. Your goal is to sort of surf the Tao. Um, and it's possible to understand the laws of the universe, the laws of the cosmos, with study of the Tao. And, you know, there are very famous scholars, from Lao Tzu to Chonza to Confucius, who also studied the Tao. Uh, and Sun Tzu is from this tradition. He's steeped in this cosmology. His, his work is, assumes this. It's like, uh, you can't read Clausewitz with, uh, without understanding, um, you know, Plato and the Enlightenment and the culture and the intellectual currents of those days. 
phrase, or Immanuel Kant. This portrait on your left here, this painting, is a very famous painting called the Vinegar Tasters. It's an ancient paint, uh, there, ver, uh, painting. It's, there are many versions of it. There are woodcuts, there are scrolls, or everything. It shows the three major religions of uh, later on. It shows uh, a smiling, these are all wise men. It shows a smiling wise man who's a Taoist. It shows a, a neutral face who's a Buddhist. And it shows a frowny face, which is the Confucius. These are three wise men. They're around a vat of vinegar and they are tasting it. The Confucius is frowning because it is sour and it does not comport to the cosmic harmony that he saw the day needed. Uh, he was very, as you recall, he's very sort of rules bound. He's very about knowing one's place in one's society. And if you're out of place in a strict hierarchy, uh, then things are sour. That's not the Taoist way, by the way. It's a sort of a very structured view of society. So the Confucius tastes it and says, it's bad. The Buddhist tastes it, and he has a neutral face. He says it's neither bad nor good. It just is. It's just, it just is. Um, uh, and then the, the Taoist tastes it and, and smiles. And he says, you might think it's sour, but this is the nature of vinegar. And it's in the Tao, and that is good. So Taoist is not like Confucianism, where it has a structure for you. With It's not fatalistic. It is simply... Think of the world as a cosmo cosmology of energy, and it's better to co go with the flow than against it. And this is the concept of Wu Wei in ancient China and ancient Taoism. One of the favorite metaphors of Taoists is water going downhill. Water going downhill takes the easiest path possible, the natural path possible. And in this sense, it's sort of go with the flow. It's the concept of non-action. And non-action here doesn't mean you're lazy. Non-action means harmonizing with the way. Don't fight the way. You still have to do effort, but be like water flowing downhill. And if you fight the way, if you want to go water and go uphill, uh, it's like swimming up a waterfall. It's not possible. So again, the way or the Tao is the natural law of the universe. It's a cosmic energy, sort of like the force, or chi is like the force, but it represents a larger cosmology. One of the things about Taoism is that it has this idea of duality. But this is a complementary duality. It's not good versus bad. The, the language of the, of the Tao, the language of uh, Sun Tzu, the language of the I Ching, language of Lao Tzu, it all uses these concepts. Um, so here we have light and dark. Not one is better than the other. They complement, as you see with this famous Taoist symbol, yin and yang. Man and woman, heaven and earth, dragon and horse, you know, earth and heaven, fortune and misfortune, light and dark. All these, all these uh, ideas are, in, is, are pregnant in the art of war, and they're often translated in the art of war. So again, it's not about superiority of rank, it's a different way of thinking about the universe. Now, Taoism has still influence today, but you don't recognize it as Taoism. So there's, again, Chan or Zen Buddhism. And obviously, in Chinese culture, it's ever-present, even though we wouldn't call the current regime in Beijing Taoist by any measure. But culturally, it's still relevant in alchemy and astrology. Books like the I Ching are one of the most ancient books uh, in existence, up, uh, up there with Gilgamesh and others. It's a book of divination. It's not a book that you read. It's a book that you, it's like an oracle that you consult with three coins or 17 euro stocks. And if you want, I can tell you how to do that uh, some other time. Feng Shui, Qi Gong, which is sort of like uh, yoga, uh, martial arts like Wushu, all this today is uh, has the influence of Taoism, uh, including things like really bad New Age stuff coming out of Big Sur, California, and of course, Star Wars. And some of you might recognize the dude. There are a lot of academic papers, believe it or not, on is the dude a Taoist or supremely lazy? And if you don't know who the dude is, you need to Google the dude. And uh, it's a movie worth watching. The Big Lebowski. Now, the takeaway from all this is that Sun Tzu was a Taoist. 
he was a Taoist, was most everybody, uh, if not everybody in his era. Um, it's like sort of trying to understand a classic, you know, an antiquity of Greece without understanding Socrates or Plato or anything like that. This is the world he comes from. And when he writes, he is writing in this cosmology with its assumptions, with its culture. And the art of war may seem like easy reading at first, but is actually very difficult to understand. It is not the fortune cookie of strategy. That's a shallow, breezy reading of the art of war. Um, it is easy to learn, but hard to master. In some ways, it's like chess. And I'm not saying war is like chess. You've heard me before. It is not. But it's something that seems easy to learn, but yet it's very hard to master. Now, why is it so hard to read? Well, it's an ancient Chinese text. It consists like all ancient sort of texts from Asia and East, South Asia and East Asia. It was written on strips of wood, sometimes copper. You read it from right to left, from top to down, which is why Chinese and Japanese and Korean print originally was top down, uh, right to left. Now it's sort of been Romanized, uh, so it's not, not typeface, but you read it like a book, but you still read it from right to left. Um, so a thousand strips of wood, uh, it is highly metaphorical. So all the writing of this era, whether you're reading Sun Tzu or Lao Tzu or Chan Tzu or Confucius, it is metaphorical. Think of it like dense poetry, uh, where each kanji, each uh, character has multiple meanings, and those meanings are invoked like dense poetry. It uses the metaphors of ancient Taoism, of ancient Taoist uh, duality, like we talked about heaven and earth, horse and dragon, uh, but also ideas. Uh, and, uh, you know, they'll talk about using a well or, you know, those are using symbols and allegory are how treaties were made. They were not sort of logical expositions like we think of as a treaty today. They, they were like more like dense poetry. And it's not a Western style of argument. Also, you notice that there are these things called commentaries. So commentaries are, co are common in ancient Chinese literature. They are not common today. So what is a commentary? Imagine this. Imagine uh, Julius Caesar writes his book uh, on the Gallic campaign uh, in 44 BCE. And over the centuries, famous uh, scholars, famous generals read it and they, they scribble in the margins. And those, marg those scribbles are saved, but they're saved as commentaries. So can you imagine reading um, Julius Caesar's Conquest of Gaul, but you have Napoleon's commentaries, you have Charlemagne's commentaries, you have uh, you, you know, some Pope, you know, you have Arist you know, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas' commentaries. Those commentaries of the most famous thinkers and generals for the last 2,400 years of Chinese histories are included in like sort of the massive bound edition of the Art of War. And think how cool that would be to read like Napoleon's commentaries on Julius Caesar, right? Think of what we could learn from that. So that is what uh, ancient China does with its ancient texts that you see the commentaries for uh, the Analects by Confucius, by Lao Tzu's the Tao Te Ching. It's common. And I wish, you know, the West had that tradition. It doesn't. Some translations include the commentaries. Some do not. When they include the commentaries, it could be quite confusing for first-time readers because it'll give a line of Sun Tzu, and then it'll have like ten different commentaries for people you've never heard of, and you're like, and and if you're if you're a newbie to this new type of ancient text, it's utterly confusing. It's utterly confusing. So for all of these reasons, the highly metaphoric uh, language, the the commentaries, the assumption of Taoist knowledge, there are many translations of the art of war, and they vary a lot. They vary a lot. Um, the best way, to, if you really want to learn the art of war, is buy all the translations in English or whatever language and read them all and compare them. It's not an easy task, but that's really what's required. Um, the, the common go-to translation in war colleges is the Samuel Griffith one from 1961, 1962. Um, it's an okay translation. It's, it's fine. It's not 
the best. It's not the worst. The uh, the one of the worst is uh, is Lionel Giles, I think, from 1909 in English. It's not very good. Um, it's the one that's free. It's one you can get on of Gutenberg Press, etc. Uh, Samuel Griffith was a actually he was a Marine Colonel. He was a China hand after World War II. And uh, towards the end of his career, he went to Oxford to do a doctorate, and his uh, his main an ancient classical Chinese studies, and his sort of dissertation, if you will, was, was the was this translation of the Art of War, which was published in 1962. It's okay. I think the U.S. military likes it because it was written by one of their own, uh, and you'll see the foreword is by Little Hart, who is a significant figure, which we'll talk about later. Um, we talked about him briefly at the end of Clausewitz. I kind of like other translations like Thomas Cleary, uh, Sawyer, and some others. I think uh, Thomas Cleary is one of the best translations, but he, he's one of the guys who includes the commentaries with the text, and that can be very confusing. But his foreword, which I urge you to read, is the best foreword. It sort of lays out the cosmology of Taoism, Sun Tzu's place in it, the art of war's place, contextualized in Chinese history. It's a 50-page foreword, but I think it's it's probably the best primer on the Sun uh, of Sun Tzu available. I also assigned, in addition to the text, Text in the forward, an actual an illustrated version of uh, Sun Tzu with a forward by uh, Lawrence Friedman, who's a very famous strategic scholar. And the, it's, 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 uh, it's a cartoon, but it's actually quite good. And it might be a good first pass of Sun Tzu. And then I recommend now you would read like The Art of War by Thomas Cleary. And then you'll have better context for the commentaries, better context for Sun Tzu. So it's a better, I think it's a two-step process, not to be confused with a Texas stamp, but start with the illustrated version and go to the text after that. Now, The Art of War has been around for 24, 2,500 years, and for good reason. It's been highly influential. It's been read throughout ancient China, throughout ancient Asia, Mao Zedong, which we'll get to later in another lecture. Ho Chi Minh was very, um, was very tied to it. Uh, others include Little Hart, who wrote the, the preface or the foreword for the Samuel Griffith version. He was uh, a British officer in World War I who came out of World War I like many extremely skeptical of the Prussian school of warfare. He and many others blame the carnage, fairly or unfairly, they blame the carnage of World War I on the Jominian Clausewitzian mindset of the 19th century. Uh, and afterwards, he became probably the most outspoken strategic thinker uh, in the interwar years in the English world, English-speaking world, and he certainly was a very big critic of Clausewitz. Uh, and he embraces Sun Tzu, and, and he writes a book later on called The Indirect Approach, which is a Sun Tzuian take on warfare, um, kind of utterly ignored in World War II. Um, but I think you could argue he was a war prophet ahead of his time. Also, you see it used and misused all the time in the business world. The business world likes to quote it and misquote it. It's sort of like Sun Tzu with war scholars. Because it sort of seems like a fortune cookie, you can, you can quote it and misquote it for anything out of context. And people do. Larry Ellison, one of the richest men in the world and remaining you know, for now decades, one of the richest men in the world, uh, owns Oracle, loves to sail, um, loves Sun Tzu. Um, and takes a lot of, is influenced by Sun Tzu. Uh, and of course, you know, you see it in common culture too. You see it in common culture all the time. Now, let's get back to Sun Tzu in a way from common culture's reading or misreading of Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a Chinese general during the Warring States period. Think of the Warring States period as Mad Max and the Thunderdome in ancient China. The Warring States period lasted for a few hundred years. Sun Tzu was at the very beginning, uh, just as Confucius was at the very beginning, and Lao Tzu were also at the very beginning. And it, it sort of saw the end of a dynasty. Uh, and what happened in the, in the vacuum of power was, was endless and total war. Endless and total war, sort of a very Hobbesian universe. And this is what he... what. He was uh, hired by the king of Wu. This is Wu here. 
to basically wage war on behalf of Hu against the other great powers. Now, Wu was the, of these sort of great powers, or I think it's seven or eight initially, and lots of minor powers, uh, and a war against all, uh, for, for all, by all, Wu was like the least powerful of the great powers. And Sun Tzu's strategic problem was, how do you win if you've been dealt a bad hand? How do you win? And not just survive, but how do you actually win? Um, so... Let's go forward now. Let's go fast forward beyond Sun Tzu's lifetime and see how the Warring States period pans out, because it's one of the most significant times in Asian history and in an area of study that I wish more Western scholars took on. This and the, the Three Kingdoms era that China that came a couple centuries later. Let's look at the Warring States period. You can see powers gobbling each other up. The Qin seem to be doing well. Wu disappears, gobbled up. And the Qin take over. And they rule for uh, centuries. And some, some argue, uh, Chinese historians argue, that they were the most significant and most important dynasty in the history of China, uh, which is really fighting words since there's like 4,000 years or 3,000 years of, arguably up to 4,000 years of ancient Chinese dynastic history. Um, but it's, it's remarkable. So this was a period of total war, uh, everybody fighting everything for everything. It was, a, it was an era of total upheaval and change. Sun Tzu's strategic problem was this. It's the classic David versus Goliath problem, where he was David versus his neighbors who were Goliath. So can the weak defeat the strong, is his question, with the maximum economy of force? What the maximum economy of force means is that can you do it on the cheap? Can you fight war on the cheap? Because remember, um, he, he's of the great powers. He, they have the, the, the weakest army, the least amount of resources. He needs, to fight, he needs to fight war on the cheap, not losing soldiers, not because he's a humanitarian. Sun Tzu is not a humanitarian. He just can't afford to lose soldiers. You know, if you've got, you know, 20,000 soldiers, your em enemies have 120,000 soldiers, you're going to have to be very cunning or something. And he wants to win. He doesn't want to just survive. And he wants to uh, use more than a strategy of luck and hope. He wants to create a strategy for David to defeat Goliath. And he comes up with one. Sun Tzu's answer in the art of war is akin to this. To win, fight like a black cat in a dark room fight like a black cat in a dark room. That's not him saying that, that's McFate saying that. But if it'll make sense when you read it. So let's quickly compare and contrast Clause Fits. And this is a very simplistic and fa facile comparison, but it's an effective one to start us out. So here we are, Sun Tzu and Klaus Fitz. Now we have no portrait of Sun Tzu at all or a statue of Sun Tzu, but here's a guy that we think looks like Sun Tzu. So Klaus Fitz advocates you be the gladiator. You know, the, the mighty warrior wins the day through brute force and skill. That's how you win, through brute force and skill. Sun Tzu says, no, you've got to be the sneaky ninja. Not through brute force, but through skill and cunning. So Klaus Fitz says, be the gladiator. Sun Tzu says, be the ninja. By the way, there were no ninjas in Sun Tzu's day. That became later on in, in, in samurai Japan around the 15th and 16th century CE. But just hold me, hold with it for the analogy. Klaus Fitz is gladiator, Sun Tzu is ninja. Or think of it this way. Klaus Fitz says, be the lion on the savannah. Be the, the animal, be the king of animals. Win by brute force and, you know, and skill and weaponry. Sun Tzu says, no, be the Heidi Fox. Win through skill and cunning. So again, Klaus Fitz is all about force. Sun Tzu is all about cunning. Now, 
for them, they do agree on a few things, not much. They agree on, on what is the nature of war. They say war is political. We know that from Klaus Fitz reading on war. This is the very first line of the art of war. War is a matter of vital importance to the state. War is political, is what, the, the, what that implies. That's the very first line. You fight wars not for glory. You don't fight wars for, you know, booty. You fight wars because it's existential for the state. And that also war is a part of the human condition. You know, as, as enlightened as we all may become, we will find still new ways to kill each other. And war can and should be studied. You're not just born with it. Um, you're not just, you know, some people get it, some people don't. We are all born with a certain talent for it, like anything else, whether it be football or playing an instrument or math or whatever. We are born with certain aptitude for it, but you can hone that aptitude with study and discipline. Uh, he also says ignorance of warfare brings misfortune to the army and to the people by extension, right? And to the state. So there's a price for being dumb. There's a price for being dumb. On this, Klaus Fitz and Sun Tzu wholly agree. That's why they commit to a book studying warfare is because of all this. They don't think you're just born with it or you're just lucky. They think it can be learned and it should be learned. But they differ on most everything else. Particularly when it comes to grand strategy. And the civ mill relationship is one example of this. So Sun Tzu believes that, uh, like many uh, of Klaus Fitz's peers, including Jomini, believes that once wars start, the general should take over. It's no time for amateur hours. Rulers, civilian rulers are amateur hours. Princes, emperors, presidents, they're all amateur hours. All they're going to do is just get your nation killed or, or expend uh, valuable resources in horrible ways. So once the war starts, you let the experts take control of everything, of everything. And that the civilian leader should, should refrain from interfering. This is exactly what Jomini believes. Um, and this is, you know, as he says, not just from the apocryphal case of Sun Tzu's job interview, but he, he talks about, and think, see if you agree with this, that kings and politicians have only empty words, and they're not capable of putting those words into action. Um, and that, you know, when it comes to commands, the sovereign need not be obeyed, need not be obeyed. So this is a very strong civ mill uh, relationship in opposition to Klaus Fitz and Western civ mill norms of today. The idea, though, that that the the general gives back the authority to, you know, to civilians after the war is complete. Um, that the that the general knows his or her place, which is a mighty assumption. But this also means that Sun Tzu's scope and frame for thinking about the art of war truly does extend to grand strategy. He has to consider all instruments of power and not just the military one, because the civ male relationship of Sun Tzu is that once there's a war, the general takes over everything. It's like a military junta, um, a military regime, where all aspects of power are at the general's fingertips. In Klaus Fitz's world, all aspects of power are not at the general's fingertips because you're working with civilian counterparts in the civ male relationship of Klaus Fitz. So, Klaus Fitz would strongly disagree on this, and uh, Sun Tzu might say, hey, you're just, a, you're just a, a military campaign planner is all you are at the end of the day. You never consider all aspects of, of national power, just the military one at the operational art level, and if you do consider things like allies, it's just in passing, and it's a fair critique of both of them. It's a fair critique of both of them. You can decide which one you favor. So, as you already can guess, the utility of force differs quite a bit between the two of them. Klaus Fitz and Jomini, uh, conventional warfare scions, believe in a high utility of force, that when 
push comes to shove between political disagreements of states, ultimately the deciders organize violence, like two gladiators fighting, duking it out. Um, and they believe that, you know, military might is the ultimate form of national power, diplomacy, economics, culture, everything else is secondary. Hence, they focus their study on the military. They believe in a very high utility of force to win wars. Sun Sun Tzu has a complete opposite point of view, complete opposite. He says that, you know, those who rely on force are the dunderheads of strategy. The purpose of warfare is that you win war before you even have to fight. You win war before you even have to fight. And remember, he's dealing with an economy of force problem. So he's looking at how do you win war on the cheap? You do it before you have to commit soldiers to battle. And then battles go all sorts of ways. You know, even as Klausfit says, chance and luck play a, a factor. It's a big gamble. So Sun Tzu is focusing on attaining victory with the minimum of force. And probably not just because he had a weaker army. His strategy as a whole, as you will see, uh, uses force, but uses it in a very different way than Klaus Fitz in Germany. And he, part of it, he does it for economic reasons. He says you want to capture a, your enemy state whole. You don't want to ob obliterate it, annihilate it, because you want, you need it, right? You need it. To, to produce resources, you need it to hold it. So it's better to capture it whole, to take the state intact. Otherwise, you just simply ruin it. Um, and this is something that Klaus Fitch and Germany never think about, is what happens after conflict? What, what happens in post-conflict, you know, phase four, as we might call it today? They never even think about it. Never even crosses their mind. Sun Tzu wants to capture states, not destroy them. And for this, he, he has a different way of warfare. So again, Sun Tzu's metric for skill, for strategic IQ is this. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. This is the supreme art of war. Now to Clausewitzian scholars, to Germanian scholars, to Western strategic thinkers, this produces cognitive dissonance. It makes their heads explode. They're like, well, how do you do that? That's impossible. If we could do that, we wouldn't have a war in the first place. The diplomats could solve it. And Sun Tzu says, no, no, no. There are ways to do this. So let's look at Sun Tzu's actual strategies now. He gives four strategies. Four strategies. And there are hierarchy from the best to worst. And we're going to look at best first and go to the worst. The best form of victory is to subdue your enemy without force. We already covered that. How do you do it? You attack the enemy's strategy. Now, again, Klaus Witzian thinkers, Western strategic thinkers, their heads explode at this moment. If your head's exploding, it means perhaps you're a Western strategic thinker or you're a Klaus Witzian thinker. But, you know, expand your mind for a second and give it a try. So he says that those in, who are skilled in war or strategy, they bring the enemy to the field of battle are not brought there by him. He's using that as an allegory, I believe. Much of, remember, much of his text is, you know, allegorical connotation. Um, and to do this, you have to know your enemy inside out, how to manipulate them. And you need to know yourself as well. Hence, we get the famous Sun Tzu bumper sticker, know the enemy and know yourself, right? It's sort of like up there with Klaus the the uh, you know, wars, politics by other means. If there's one quote that everybody knows of Sun Tzu, it's, you know, know the enemy and know yourself. That's what he means. Um, you have to manipulate the enemy. And the best form of doing that is to attack the enemy's strategy. Think of it this way. Strategic... Jiu-jitsu. You're pulling strategic jujitsu on your enemy. Again, jujitsu is not something in his day. Jujitsu again came. It's a martial art form in Japan, uh, which is far more recent, last you know two hundred or more years. But the idea of jujitsu is that, in some ways, like aikido as well, another Japanese martial art, is that you use your enemy's strength against them. You use your enemy's strength against them. So an example of how to do this might be the counterinsurgency strategy, which we'll discover, uh, we'll discuss later on in another lecture. 
The counterinsurgency strategy tries to use the enemy's, uh, tries to attack the enemy's strategy. So uh, initially, it's in, in the Iraq War, uh, the U.S. and allies had a very Klaus Witzian approach to counterterrorism and to counterinsurgents. It tried to kill them with a high utility of force, right? It went around the countryside trying to find insurgents and kill them. Uh, and this, what this did was actually produce more insurgents. Uh, people who were neutrals then had, you know, some, one of their cousins killed in collateral damage, and now they became radicalized. Now they became insurgents. And soldiers, uh, American soldiers, quip that this is the whack-a-mole strategy. That as much as you uh, bop... You know, whack-a-mole is an arcade game in, at least in America and I think in Europe, where you have a mallet and you, you whack a mole, like a, like a dummy mole comes out of a hole and you whack it and there's like three more holes and you more keep on coming up if you keep on whacking them. And this is uh, the whack-a-mole strategy. What counterinsurgency does is it tries to attack the enemy's strategy. Instead of trying to kill them with a Clausewitzian logic, it goes around and tries to win hearts and minds. So the insurgent is trying to win hearts and minds of a neutral population to join the insurgency. Now you're playing the insurgent's game by trying to win hearts and minds away from the insurgent and towards you. That is an example of attacking your enemy's strategy. In this case, the counterinsurgency strategy tries to defeat the insurgent at his or her own game by trying winning hearts and minds and stop playing whack-a-mole. So again, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. You have to attack the enemy's strategy. But to do this, you must know how the enemy works and how to manipulate them, and as well as what your pros and cons are. Hence, to do this, intelligence is everything. Intelligence is everything. As you recall, Clausewitz was not a great believer in intelligence. He believed in the need for it, but he distrusted in, you know, intelligence officers. He, he said that their reports were conflicting, often wrong, can't be trusted, etc. Sun Tzu has the opposite. He's like, intelligence is everything. And maybe he would say to, to Klaus Fitz, maybe you're just really, you had really bad intelligence officers or you just don't know how to use it. All right, that's the first in the hierarchy. The second of the hierarchy is to disrupt the enemy's alliance system. You want to win you want to strip the enemy of his or her alliance, and you want to win alliance for yourself. You want to win allies for yourself. So again, you do this before, quote unquote, war even begins. To Sun Tzu, this is part of war. This is part of the spectrum of war and conflict. To Germany and to Clausewitz, this is pre-war. To the Western thinker, this is pre-war. To international public lawyers, this is pre-war. Yet to Sun Tzu and to uh, you know to, to others of his ilk, this is it's, there's no such thing as war and peace. It's just armed conflict, or there's just conflict. Um, and so look at this. So he's talking about alliances and diplomacy and coercive diplomacy before, during, and after war. Clausewitz never even thinks about this. Doesn't even consider it. He thinks that's the job of civilians. The third strategy is to attack the enemy's military. And this is where Clausewitz starts. This is where Germany starts, you know, attack. And this is actually where Clausewitz says this is the best place to start. In this is, you know, number three out of four for Sun Tzu. It's one out of uh, for Clausewitz. But he also, Sun Tzu is clever about it. It's not just, you know, using conventional ways of warfare and norms that Clausewitz implies, he never really, con uh, Clausewitz never really considers unconventional forms of war. Um, he just thinks about organized militaries, Napoleonic formations, force on force. He only a little bit in book six talks about the power of guerrilla warfare, but it's just in passing and he dismisses them as easily defeated against a, a, a professional army easily defeated. Whereas Sun Tzu thinks about traditional and non-traditional tactics married together for infinite permutations. So he's thinking about, sometimes it's translated as orthodox or non-orthodox warfare, but you mix and match these things. You don't just fight one style. You keep the enemy guessing. 
So his third strategy is to attack the enemy's army. This is where Clausewitz and Western strategic thinkers just start thinking about warfare. The last, the last strategy, the least good strategy is this, is siege warfare. Siege warfare is protracted conflict. Uh, think of, uh, you know, siege, you know, middle, in European Middle Ages, siege warfare was the primary form of warfare. Uh, sieging castles, besieging castles. Sun Tzu says that's, the, that's for the low strategic IQ in the crowd. Uh, the reason is protracted conflict ties your enemy down. It's very expensive for resources. You often have he heavy casualties, whether it's uh, you know uh, something like World War One or in siege. You have you have winter, you have disease, you have starvation, famine. It happens to both the the people who are being besieged and the siegers themselves, and it disrupts whole economies. It's often attrition-based warfare, and this comes down to not skill, but who lasts longer. So this is, for Sun Tzu, this is like those out there who are the least skill fight attrition-based warfare. And I believe his critique of World War I is that those the, the, the leadership, whether it's General Haig or Ludendorff, were strategically unimaginative, and a lot of people paid with their blood. You know, we I, we kind of joke today. This is Ludendorff syndrome of of, uh, but it's not just Ludendorff. It's also general, the British General Haig as well. But this is the worst form of warfare. He says it's still viable. It's just the worst. Everything else after this, they would even consider it strategically. So the best thing is to use cunning and attack the enemy's strategy, which requires a high strategic IQ. The worst is just brute on brute slugfest. That's the worst. So again, this is the metric of success for a strategist or a grand strategist is for to, you know, to win 100 victories in 100 battles is not the acme of skill. So operational art is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting, that's the zenith or acme of skill. And you look at the U.S., you know, in Vietnam, it, it won every war. I mean, sorry, it won every battle, but didn't lose the war. I'm sorry. In Vietnam, the U.S. won every battle but lost the war. Same with Iraq. Same with Afghanistan. Sun Tzu's critique is, you know, you may have a really fine military, but the strategic leadership at the top is lacking. It's lacking. And he would, he would say that, you know, the North Vietnamese were quite clever. Um, and indeed, I think, objectively, they were. So the, the idea here is that you have to win before the battle even begins. So you have to win before the battle begins. But how? How do you do this, Sun Tzu? He advocates something called the indirect approach. And it has four features. And by the way, when Little Hart wrote his book, The Indirect Approach, in the late 1930s as um, sort of a counterweight to the Clausewitzian Germanian way of war, he titled it The Indirect Approach. Uh, and he takes from Sun Tzu's ideas. World War II proceeded without him <laughs> and the indirect approach. It was fought on very Clausewitzian ideals. But the idea here is, is this, the indirect approach. And this is what Sun Tzu advocates. The first of the four features is this, is what he calls advantageous position. And this is Sun Tzu's maneuver warfare. It's a sort of operational art. And he wants, remember, he's the sneaky fox. He's the sneaky fox. And the objective here is not to annihilate your enemy. It's not to, as, as Clausewitz would say, Put the you know put the mass of your forces on the enemy's weak point, preferably the center of gravity, to destroy them and break them apart. He Sun Tzu plays a different game. He says the idea here is to get your enemy to make a mistake, and a mistake that you can exploit, and you can win this. You can win against your enemy if you can make them make mistakes. So advantageous position looks like this. Now, to others of you, this should look very familiar. These are the precepts of guerrilla warfare. 
the use of the precepts of uh, what we might think of special operations warfare in some ways too. You attack where the enemy is weak. You attack where he does not expect you. You don't let the enemy know what your weaknesses and strengths are. You misguide him, right? You don't attack fortified points, but instead you attack the enemy where they're weak and you engage them elsewhere. You find out where the enemy is while you conceal your position. You erect the fog of war and you use it for victory this way. Um, if you choose where to attack, the enemy must defend everywhere. If you can maintain the initiative uh, and, and you're invisible to the enemy, then they must defend everywhere all the time, which spreads their, spreads their mighty force thin. So if they, have a, if they have a high concentrated force, this is a way to dilute it. And if you know where the next battle takes place, you can prepare for it. This is how guerrilla war warriors fight. And it's no surprise that guerrilla warfare um, uses Sun Tzuian tactics and they read the art of war. The second are superior capabilities. Superior capabilities. Now, this doesn't just mean, you know, technology and weapons. It also includes moral factors. And this, I think, Clausewitz would agree with. He also talks about moral factors. Um, and this has to deal with, you know, the willingness of soldiers to fight, um, uh, how revved up they are about the, the cause, etc., versus homesick soldiers, sluggish soldiers, soldiers who don't really want to fight. Physical factors, too. This is your strength, your constitution. Uh, you know, are you rested? Are you exhausted? And how, as well as the other, as the enemy? Remember, he always talks about know yourself and know your enemy in, along these axes, both moral factors and physical factors. Third is intelligence. And here's where Clausewitz and Sun Tzu really diverge. So <clears throat> Clausewitz, I mean, Sun Tzu is all about intelligence. He is all about, because, you know, remember, he's trying to learn how to manipulate your enemy, and that requires a deep knowledge of your enemy, and that requires intelligence, both collection and analysis. He doesn't use those terms. That's how we think about it today. And he lays out a whole sort of typology of spies, and you can tell he was a big uh, intel ma master. Uh, so he talks about secret operations as essential in war. It's essential. Uh, and upon them, the army relies on everything. I mean, that's the complete opposite of Clausewitz. An army without secret agents is like a man without eyes or ears. So reconnaissance is not just the cavalry marching forward, as maybe Clausewitz might have thought about in his Napoleonic era. The, the idea now is that you have eyes and ears in taverns, you have eyes and ears everywhere. It's not just a military maneuver for military intelligence on a tactical level. It's everywhere. And if you want to think about this, think about George Washington in the American Revolutionary War, who ran you know, secret spy rings um, you know, in New York City, across Virginia and Boston to find out what the British were doing, which we will come to when we discuss the U.S. Uh, American Revolutionary War in one of our case studies. Um, so all of this hinges upon the uh, the intelligence network that you build, the type of, he has against spies, including spies which are um, you know disposable spies, if you want to think about that. But intelligence is critical. It's uh, to use Clausewitzian language, it is a center of gravity, and uh, you know this is something that Clausewitz would disagree with. <laughs> The last thing, which is deception, and deception is, you know, you use intelligence to create strategic deception, and deception is also a center of gravity, again, using Clausewitzian language to describe a Sun Tzuian concept. This is what war is to Sun Tzu. So war to Clausewitz is based on military might, a high utility of force, Sun Tzu says, okay, you know, there's a role for the military, there's a war for organized violence, but it's not really the most, it, that's low tier. High tier stuff is deception. How do you create deception? So look at this scene from Star Wars. Is it sneaky? Is it strong? Or is it both? Klaus Fitz and most Western military thinkers think that sneakiness and deception is weak. It's a weak form of warfare where Sun Tzu says not only, it, not only is it strong, it's the most decisive form of warfare. 
So when, you know, again, when you're capable, fake incapacity. When you're active, fake inactivity. When near, make it seem like you're far away. When far away, make it seem like you're near. You know, bait your enemy, manipulate your enemy, create disorder. So where Sun Tzu, well, where CrossFit's bewails the, the fog and friction of war as getting in the way of military victory. Sun Tzu is about creating fog, creating victory, uh, creating a friction and weaponizing it for victory. He says, those are not your adversaries. Those are your tools. Um, you know, create the fog of war and exploit it for victory. So again, let's compare. Sun Tzu says, all warfare is based on deception. Now, to him, war is about deception. I mean, both Clausewitz and Sun Tzu agree that the purpose of war is political, but weight warfare itself, for Sun Tzu, it's all about deception. For Clausewitz, it's all about you know military on military, organized violence. And he thinks that deception and ruses, and et cetera, these, these never work. He says like they almost never work, and intelligence can't be trusted. But Sun Tzu disagrees with Clausewitz for these reasons. One is that you create the fog of war for exploitation. You weaponize friction and make it your ally. Don't just be a victim to it. Make it your ally. It allows also for an economy of force because you can fight by, um, you know, cre by creating the conditions for like your enemy's army to starve to death. Right, you don't need to go force on force. You let starvation work its work its quote unquote magic. Um, this reduces the utility of force in Sun Tzu's way of warfare, which again allows an economy of force, and you create false impressions for the enemy so that he makes mistakes, and his mistakes are your opportunities. That is the strategic logic of. Sun Tzu. You, you make the enemy or manipulate the enemy to make mistakes that you can exploit for your victory. And you gain time and deny the enemy intelligence, right? So for him, warfare is a very much an information uh, competition. It's not force on force. Battlefield technologies are secondary. It's really about having information dominance, not force dominance. And cunning is a, an old way of war, and perhaps it came out of the warring states period where uh, this was, these were total uh, total wars and extreme slugfests, and you had to be cunning and not just strong. So the also in this time came the ancient 36 ancient strategy, stratagems for war. China, there was another general like Sun Tzu. We don't know who he was, but he came up with these 36 stratagems, or we think he did. These 36 stratagems are used today. These 36 stratagems, um, and they're, they're grouped in, into, into groups of six. Um, I talk about them in my book, The New Rules of War, which explain how the type of warfare works today. Um, and this is, you, these are all about cunning and deception. And if you're going to do business, literally, <laughs> the U.S. military doesn't even know that these exist. Western militaries do not study these at all. But you know who, who does study them? Are Western businessmen who do business in China. And that's how I came to know of the 36 ancient stratagems, not from security studies at Harvard or from uh, war college syllabi. I came to from a, from a colleague who works in a multinational corporation, a big one that does a lot of business in China. And their, their executive office, their C-suite, if you will, all this was required reading for them before they went to Shanghai or Beijing or whatever to negotiate with China is the 36 stratagems because in Chinese business, like in other parts of Chinese culture, they use this. They use this. Not the PLA, uh, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and others who operate at the strategic level of China and not the operational level of China, they use this. So take a look at the stratagems are in the back of the book, The New Rules of War. So in summary, this is the indirect approach advantageous position, superior capabilities, using intelligence, creating deception. Let's look at an analogy very quickly of Sun Tzu's way of war in this simple idyllic watering hole. As his confidence builds, he is oblivious 
to what lurks beneath the surface. The herd is bewildered. Some have never seen a crocodile before. Even as the full horror unfurls, there is great confusion about just what is going on. Sun Tzu's way of war, enacted by a crocodile. So, Sun Tzu also has some operational art guidance. Some operational art guidance for those of you out there. It is a rule of war, he says, if 10 times the enemy's strength, you surround them. If five times, attack them. If double, divide them. If equal, engage them. If fewer, evade them. If weaker, then avoid them. You can imagine him giving these rules of engagement to a subordinate commander. Also, this concept of Wu Wei. Remember how we talked about it earlier with like water flowing downhill like a waterfall? This is sort of, if you want to extend it to uh, Sun Tzu, um, it's sort of like go with flow. And it means strategic patience. Do not charge into a situation. Wait, instead watch and observe the situation like a cat might watch and observe a mouse before it pounces. See it develop and look for opportunities to exploit. Be clever. Win before the first art uh, shot is fired. This is not something the West does very well. The West likes to charge in there and figure it all out once it's, you know, once it's clobbered. You know, the enemy's been clobbered. He's saying, no, let's do strategic patience and watch it. And if you look at it, China does have strategic patience today, right? I mean, you know, leaving the PLA out of it, the People's Liberation Army is not uh, China's national security. It's, it's only part of the National Security Committee. China, unlike um, the United States, doesn't put all of its eggs in the military basket. It, it, it uses a variety of grand strategic methods, uh, which are effective. <laughs> uh, how effective they'll be in the future is up for debate, but they're working out pretty well right now. Um, and uh, they, have, they have strategic patience. They want to be regional hegemon by 1 October 2048. 1 October 2048, whereas the United States changes its strategic patience every 48 years, and uh, that's no strategic patience. And when it sees something like 9-11, it goes off into war in Afghanistan and into Iraq, from which 9-11 didn't even emanate, uh, and then gets bogged down. And this is an example of what Sun Tzu would call victorious warriors win first and then go to war. They think it through and they make a plan and then they go to war because they may have strategic patience, while the defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win, which I think is how the U.S. went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam and other places. The victorious warriors think it through, watch the situation develop, you know, have strategic patience, whereas the defeated warriors charge in first and then once they're there, they figure out how they're going to win. All right, so let's compare and contrast CLOSFITs one last time to help you understand the, the similarities and differences. They have similarities, but they have more differences. Similarities, they look at war as a political instrument. You don't do it because you're gory. You don't do it uh, because you want glory. You do it because it serves a political purpose. Study of war is possible. And that war is an art. It's not rational, uh, but it's it, but it can be studied. So on these first two things, they agree. On other things, they do not. On Civ Mill, Clausewitz believes that you know civilians and military strategists have to work together, have to work together to control war. Uh, the reason is is that st the military generals generally want to escalate war, as is the nature of war, and civilian authorities generally act as the uh, the brakes on that. The, they're like uh, the firefighters firefighters putting out the the house on fire. 
Whereas Sun Tzu, like Jomini and many others, believe that once war starts, <clears throat> the military leadership should take over because they're experts in this, and that civilian authorities can even be ignored. Uh, they, and they should certainly not interfere in the war until it's over. And once the war is over, then the military hands back authority to civilian leaders. But as I said earlier, that is strategically dangerous. I mean, we can't, can we assume that, um, which is, again, part of the American civ mill ethos of having a civilian-controlled military so you don't have a military coup d'etat. Now, the objective of war is different. Uh, both of them say you want to compel the enemy to do your will. However, how you do it is different. So for Clausewitz, you start with defeating the enemy's army in decisive battle. You concentrate all your forces at a decisive point. However, for Sun Tzu, the supreme strategy involves no fighting. The best strategy is to defeat your enemy before uh, the first shot is fired. And he has, remember, the four hierarchies of strategy, starting with you attack your enemy's strategy first. Starting, and we talked about what that was. Also, you, utility of force. Clausewitz rates the utility of force very highly. He calls it gewalt. Uh, the, whereas Sun Tzu, he calls it Lee, says it's actually quite weak. The utility of force, this is how weak strategic commanders win. They, they're not clever. They, all they can do is rely on their brute strength. He says this is the sign of a low strategic IQ. And the power of deception. Clausewitz finds deception and cutting of very little value in warfare and strategy, whereas Sun Tzu, it's everything. All war is based on deception. And this requires intelligence. Uh, Clausewitz disdains in the intelligence profession. He says intelligence community is unreliable, that the fog of war, uh, friction result from, from the lack of intelligence, and these are all you know bad things. These are frowny face things. Whereas Sun Tzu is the opposite. He says, like, we, if war is based in deception, you, everything rests on intelligence. You have to know your enemy inside and out. You need to manipulate them. That's, you know, hence, you know your enemy, know yourself. Um, and you have to create uh, the fog of war. You don't be bewail it. You create the fog of war and use it for your exploitation. You weaponize friction. And so all this way of warfare is antithetical to Clausewitz. So think of it this way, in a very, this is a very pro, pro uh, sorry, pro Sun Tzuian perspective is this, is that if you're Sun Tzu, you may be weaker, but you have the cape. And the idea is you want to manipulate your enemy and charge and charge them into, into a wall or make, make them do something they don't want to do. So you are weaker, but you, you're smarter and you're armed with a red cape and the enemy is a dumb ox and you can manipulate that. So this is what he means, that every battle is won before it is fought. You use attack your enemy's strategy, you use di diplomatic means, use all instruments of national power. You try to get them to make mistakes. So that, that when there is a battle, it's of your choosing under conditions that you made up. And they think it's their idea, but it's really your idea. Now let's look at two contemporary case studies for this Sun Tzuian way of war, because I know there's Klaus Witzian out there uh, who are saying, well, that's this briefs well McFade in, in theory, but in reality, this, this would never work. Uh, a professional military would crush any sort of feeble-minded Sun Tzuian unicorn rainbow brigade. Well, not so. We're going to look at two contemporary case studies. The first is the South China Sea. Now, when we think of the South China Sea, you're thinking about, you know, Navy on Navy fighting for islands in the middle of South China Sea covered with seagull crap and little else. So, you know, why are we fighting there? Well, the South China Sea uh, is not just a bunch of islands covered with seagull crap, which it is. It's a stage. It's a stage between two powers. There's the reigning hegemonic power of the United States of America, and there's a rising one of China. And remember, China wants to be regional hegemon by 1 October 2048, and they've told that to the entire neighbors. They've told that to the world. And so the neighbors 
uh, around this uh, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, are looking at the South China Sea like it's a stage, and they want to see who's going to be coming out on top. And the reason they do is because they feel that there are two trains leaving the station. One's going to Beijing and one's going Washington, and you have to enter a train before it leaves the station before it's too late. You may not like that train, but you want to side with the winner. And the longer you wait to side with the winner, the worse it is to you. So everybody's looking at the South China Sea to see how it plays out. And so the South China Sea is really not for islands of seagull crap, which is what operational artists think. It is a world stage for armed politics, right? It's, it's the United States of America and China communicating to the allies, the neighbor about who, which train you want to be on. Now, some uh, like the offensive school realism or Grand, Graham Allison, a Harvard scholar, uh, one of my advisors in Harvard, think that a war is inevitable between China and the United States, uh, that rising hegemons challenge reigning ones, and this inevitably results in war. Um, this is not true. There's lots of evidence in history to show that this is not true, like great European powers in the 19th century didn't go to, didn't go to war. Um, Allison calls this the Thucydides trap, not a name he made up, but a name he pilfers from elsewhere. Um, and we'll discover that there really is no such thing as a, as a Thucydides trap, as we will discuss when we actually read Thucydides. Um, Allison knows very little about uh, contemporary Chinese politics and even less about the Peloponnesian War. So the solution is to read um, Thucydides, which we will do. So the U.S. right now uses Clausewitzian strategies, whereas China is using Sun Tzuian ones. Klaus Fitz, uh, America is doing what they used to do in the Cold War. They throw in aircraft carrier groups after aircraft carrier groups, thinking that deters China. And, uh, you know, and the strategic logic is this. If you have a credible threat, meaning that you have the will and the capacity to do whoop-ass, to be soldier speak, then you will make the other back down. And we've seen this happen during the Cuban Missile Crisis, have we not? That's a, that's a Klaus Witzian strategic logic you know, stratagem. To show the threat of force and, uh, and they will back down. Well, the U.S. has been doing this for years with multiple aircraft carrier groups. China has no aircraft carrier groups, yet they're winning the South China Sea. The American Clausewitzian strategy is not working. Things like freedom of navigation operations, like FONOPS, is not deterring China. F-35s, not deterring China. You know, aircraft carriers, not deterring China. Nuclear annihilation, not deterring China. All of those things that are Klaus Witzian-based strategies are not winning. Meanwhile, China is winning with a weaker military. So how are they doing it? How are they using Sun Tzu to do it? Well, they're attacking the enemy's strategy. Remember in the hierarchy of strategies, we you know attack the enemy's strategy, says Sun Tzu. And so what they're doing is that they're using our Western strategic ideas against us. They're doing a strategic jutsu flip against us. So in, in, in Clausewitzian warfare, uh, in Western way of war, in conventional war, in, our, in our laws of armed conflict war, War and peace are thought, they're like pregnancy. You either are or you're not. You have to, you know, you're at peace, you declare war, you go to war, you do things in war that you would never morally do in peace, but you're at war, so you get a moral alibi around. And then once the war is end, you have a treaty, you go back to peace, and you live normally. So you're either at war or you're at peace. Or you think, think of it this way. Um, the Western strategic mind thinks of war like a light switch. It's either on or it's off. It's, there's no dimmer switch. So, and it's you, if you talk to any American admiral, you know, over drinks in secret, what they will tell you is like, hey, just flip that light switch to on. We will take care of the South China Sea in one afternoon. No problem. No problem. And China knows this. So what they do is they go, they get right up uh, in between, well, they go right up to the edge of war, right up to where we'd flip that light switch to on. And then they stop. They play a game, a dangerous game of chicken. And but they stop right where we actually, you know, go to war. And then they but they get to they get they keep everything they capture. 
or everything they create. And that is how they're winning the South China Sea gradually and incrementally, one island at a time, and eventually perhaps one island at a time. They're doing it using Sun Tzuian deception. They're doing it using strategic patience, and they're doing it without aircraft carrier groups. And what are they doing? They're attacking our strategy. They know that we think of war and peace as being separate and distinct spheres when they know that there's no such thing as war or peace. There's Sun Tzuian, there's just armed conflict, a broad spectrum, and they get right in between that space of war and peace in our head, and they exploit it for victory. War, war or peace is a false dichotomy. It's war and peace. And the West used to think this way during the Cold War. I mean, think about it. Was the Cold War a metaphor or was it really a war? Well, if you talk to Cold Warriors who lived in that era, obviously, they say it was a real war. It was a Cold War. It was not a metaphor. And that's how, but we somehow mysteriously in the last three decades since the Berlin Wall fell have forgotten how to think in nuanced ways about war and peace. It's war and peace, not war or peace. And China uses that for strategic gain in the South China Sea by attacking our strategy, by doing a jujitsu flip uh, on our strategy and using our weight against us. That is how they're winning the South China Sea. They're winning it at the strategic level using Sun Tzu, where the U.S. is fighting a Klaus Vitzian strategy, and it's not working. Okay, second case study. Russia takes Crimea in 2014. Now, we all know that, you know, in this sort of old rules of war, if you will, uh, in, in a Klaus Vitzian paradigm, when the Soviet Union wanted to put its boot on the neck of another state, it would roll in the tanks in a Clausewitzian logic. You know, think of Hungary 56, Czechoslovakia 68. They'd roll in the tanks and they'd physically crush the uprising, the rebellion, and they'd establish uh, their rule of law through brute force. And it was effective. That is Clausewitz. Now, they could have done that in 2014 against eastern Ukraine. Their military far outpaced uh, the Ukrainian military, and they could have blitzkrieged the Ukraine in a Clausewitzian bid for a war, but they didn't do that. Instead, they use a Sun Tzuian strategy. They created the fog of war and exploited it for victory, right? Uh, the Russians, they, they created a ghost occupation in the eastern Ukraine. Their means set to do this were not conventional war weapons like bombers and tanks and destroyers. They used weapons that gave them good, plausible deniability, things that, that were like the cat in the dark room. They used Spetsnaz special forces. They used mercenaries like the Wagner Group. They used little green men. They used these astroturfed fake Russian separatist units uh, that the GRU really controlled and manipulated. They use loads of dense propaganda coming out of the troll factory, and they had they used active measures. Active measures. Uh, so the once you know, so when Western intelligence organizations and Western policymakers were tr still trying to figure out what the heck was going on in eastern Ukraine, what were the actual facts on the ground because it was covered in this fog of war. Uh, with competing intelligence reports, the Crimea was already a fait accompli. And only then did, did Putin reveal, oh yes, we were there all along. And only then did they roll in, uh, did Russia roll in the conventional war weapons like tanks and destroyers, not to fight in the, in the conflict that was already post-conflict. It was just simply to send a message. Remember, war at the strategic level is armed politics. It was to send a message to the West, hands off, the Crimea is ours. The Crimea is ours. Now, let's look at one of the interesting ways that they did this. We all know how special forces work. We all know about little green men. We all know about uh, these fake separatist units. But we don't really know about that well is exactly what the troll factory was doing and what these mercenaries were doing. So Russia, as you know, is using is, is doing expeditionary, uh, expeditionary warfare uh, into the Middle East today and the Africa today. The first time since the Cold War they did expeditionary warfare. And their, their weapon of choice, it's not 
the Russian military. It's not Spetsnaz. It is mercenaries like the Wagner Group. And they did that in Ukraine. And they did it also in parts of uh, allegedly in Venezuela. Um, they're all over the world. So this is how it works. Putin turns to Prigozhin, one of uh, one of the oligarchs, uh, nicknamed Putin Chef, because he got his uh, his sort of up uh, his start by by running a hot dog stand outside of the mayor's office in St. Petersburg in the 1990s, where Putin was a, you know, an assistant to the mayor. It's believed that they met there. Either way, uh, Putin, uh, Pogosian creates this catering empire, which now caters to the Kremlin and to Putin personally. But Prigozhin does a lot more than just cook food for Putin. He is one of Putin's lackeys. And Prigozhin owns this gigantic, you know, well, pretty big uh, corporate empire. And the, the, the umbrella corporation is called the Concord Group. And the Concord Group uh, owns, well, it's, it, one of the guys who works for it is Dmitry Utkin. Dmitry Utkin was a, is a retired lieutenant colonel in uh, R- Russian or actually Ukrainian special forces, Spetsnaz. He gets out of the service in 2011, 2012, and starts a private military company called the Silvana Corps and does other things. He also is one of the people who started the Wagner Group as a commander. It was sort of bought or taken over by the Concord Group, and he runs Wagner. Wagner works with the Internet Research Agency, the Troll Factory, which Concord also, also controls and owns. And they reinforce each other. And this is perhaps modern warfare. Wagner, the, the Internet, the Troll Factory creates the fog of war using disinformation and misinformation. It creates the fog of war on the ground um, or conceals the, the conflict on the ground in, in, in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. And while that's happening, the Wagner Group and other um, means that give you plausible deniability are working on the ground to achieve strategic objectives. And so in this way, the Wagner Group and the Troll Factory are working in tandem. Wagner on the ground, Troll Factory to give them strategic fog of war until the Crimea is complete. And all this is done outside of normal statutory forces. This is not Russian military. The Wagner Group is not a GRU militia. They're not little green men. They are mercenaries. They are mercenaries. And this is all happening that circumvents uh, Russian law. Because Russian law, domestic law, has pretty strict anti-mercenary laws on the books. And one way that Putin gets around it is by going to his pal Prigozhin and says, just make it happen. You know, um, it's sort of like, like that that line in, uh, I forget what Shakespeare, but like, well, somebody rid me of this meddlesome priest, you know. Um, and uh, and Prigozhin says, I, I, two bags full. And then suddenly the Wagner group's on the ground disciplining um, uh, weak weak militias who are fighting a separatist, taking over Crimea. So is this, this is a very Sun Tzuian stratagem. Is this the way of the future? Because now we're seeing it in Libya and Syria and other places too. During the Crimea, this is actually what the defense minister uh, said about, you know, after it was taken. So during the, the conflict in Crimea uh, and, and eastern Ukraine, both Putin and him were saying, nothing to see here, there are no droids here, let us go through. And the world was saying, oh, well, we're not sure, but okay. And when it was all done, it was a fait accompli, play. here he says, you know, it's difficult to look for a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat. All the more so is if the cat is smart, brave, and polite. That's Sun Tzu at work today, both in the South China Sea and with Russia. So I'll leave you with these brain teasers. Is modern warfare trending more towards Clausewitz or Sun Tzu? Give an example of Sun Tzu's strategic logic at work today beyond the South China Sea or uh, what Russia has done in the Crimea and elsewhere. How does Sun Tzu differ from Clausewitz and, and who do you favor? Uh, if you were asked, like if you had to choose, who would you favor? Uh, Sun Tzu advocates winning the battle before the first shot is fired at the strategic level. Do you think, in the now reflection of Sun Tzu and your reading of him, that this is noteworthy for, today, for the 21st century or that this is mumbo-jumbo? 
And what is more important now in modern war, firepower or information? Where is victory determined? On battlefields or maybe the information space? Uh, Sun Tzu says, attack the enemy's strategy. What does this mean? And give me more examples. Sun Tzu also says, for to win a 100 victories in 100 battles is not the acme of skill. It's to subdue the enemy without fighting. Give me another example, but again, beyond the two I gave. And strategic patience is not the Western way of war. It is often seen as appeasement in the West. What do you think about that? Does this need to change or is it some fundamental form of appeasement? I leave you with those questions. If you have any questions of your own, you are welcome to email me. Here's my personal email address, uh, inquire at seanmcfate.com. It's been a pleasure. This is Sean McFate, and I hope to talk to you in the future.